glad you're here. We're in this series uh, called My Psalm Playlist. You know what a playlist is. Uh, if you don't know what a playlist, think jukebox. Uh, if you uh, know what a jukebox is, you don't need to be driving in traffic. But anyway, uh, so we're talking about this playlist. Now, uh, this means a lot to me because I, I love music. I used to be a music guy. I used to do concerts and all that. I know it's hard to believe. That was in my younger days, you know, before my Elvis years. But anyway, and so uh, I love music. But here's the thing about the music I love. I love all kinds of music. I mean, I love varied kinds of music. Of course, I love, you know, gospel and I love Christian music, contemporary Christian. I love, I love classical music. Uh, you know, I love symphony. I, I love all, I love all. I even, and I hate to admit it, but I even like show tunes. All right. Now you got to be careful when you tell people you like show tunes because you can lose your man card. I mean, you know, no, no, no. so I like all kinds of music. And the bottom line is God does too. God is very, very, uh, you know, diverse when it comes to his music. And, and, and God has a playlist too, and it's called the book of Psalms. And the Psalms are not always praise and the Psalms are not, you know, the, the Psalms are about all kinds of different things. And so we've been, we've been looking and we're going to be examining some of my, this is my prayer list, some of my, my playlist, uh, some of my favorite Psalms. Uh, and now last time we talked about Psalm 77 uh, and we looked at Asphalt and we said, we asked ourselves the question, if God is good all the time and he is, how many believe God is good all the time and he is? But the bottom line is, what if life's not good all the time and life is not good all the time? How do you navigate through that? How do you go through that when God is good all the time and yet life is not good all the time? So if you missed last Sunday, you need to go on our YouTube or go on the line or whatever. Go to b3church.org, get that message. Now today, uh, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to look at Psalm 126. So take your Bible and Turn to Psalm 126. Now, I'm going to be uh, preaching today out of the uh, King James Version uh, of the Bible, because I, I, you'll know why in just a minute. I like the way it reads. We're going to look at Psalm 126. And I told, uh, you know, the 830 crowd this morning. And, and, and by the way, let me, let me say this. This morning at 830, we had our first convert at 830. We got, somebody got saved at 830. Come on. Give Jesus a big hand clap of praise. Isn't that awesome? Makes it, makes it all worth it, man. Makes 830, worse, uh, makes 830 wor worth it all. What I love about 830 is we get to see a lot of our volunteers finally get to come and worship together as husband and wife. Uh, families get to worship with their little kids. We don't have, we don't have child care. We don't have children's department right there. They get to worship with their kids. Kids love it. It's, it's a short service. Goes 830. I'm, I promise you we're out by 915, 920. It's an awesome service. You might want to come check it out sometimes. Not for everybody. Uh, but anyway, so... Uh, is really a great time together. So I told the 8.30 service and I told the 9.30 uh, service that when it comes to Psalm 126, I'm kind of like the mosquito that landed on the fat man. Uh, I, I know what to do. I just don't know where to get started. Okay. That's funny. I don't care who you are. Come on. Somebody laugh in church. Amen. Anyway. Because there's a lot in this Psalm. There's a whole lot here that we could examine and look at. So Psalm 126, now you'll notice uh, that right off the, off the bat, it says a song of degrees. Uh, your translation makes a song of ascents. Well, what does that mean? That, what do I mean? Well, this Psalm was sung on certain, certain feast days, certain times when, uh, when the Jews were making their way up uh, to Jerusalem, when they were making their way up to the Temple Mount. Now, before I get into it today, before we get into the message, I want, I want to tell you, it's been my privilege. I was, uh, several months ago, I was asked by the Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina, uh, Dan Forrest, who's a good brother. And uh, so I was asked by him if I would be uh, one uh, of 10 pastors in North Carolina that would accompany him to go to the Holy Land. And uh, I said, well, let me pray about it. And he said, well, I want to let you know uh, there's no expense paid. It's all paid for. I said, well, okay, let me pray about it. Okay. How many of you know it don't take long to pray about something? Okay. So I'll be leaving Wednesday to go to the Holy Land, turn to the person beside you and say, I'm so jealous. And you should be. All right. Uh, but it's a privilege and honor. So, so uh, next weekend, I'll be in the Holy Land, worshiping the Lord at Holy Land. It's called the North Carolina Renewal Project. Basically, what we're doing is we're playing for revival for North Carolina with a bunch of pastors around North Carolina in the Holy Land. What better place to pray for revival than in the Holy Land? But I said all that to say this, that when, when we land in Tel Aviv, then we get it on tour bus. We go to Jerusalem. We're going up. We will wind up. 
because Jerusalem is up. It's always up. And then once you get to Jerusalem, the Temple Mount is up. So here's this psalm that they sang when they went up to Jerusalem. It's, and that's why it's called a song of the ascents. okay? Uh, so uh, take your Bible, Psalm 126, beginning at verse 1. Let's all stand uh, for the reading of God's Word today. I'm going to read out of good old-fashioned King Jimmy. And uh, so you just kind of follow along. If you have a, if you have a U version of the Bible, you can find King, King James on that as well. Uh, so so here, here's go. Verse 1. When the Lord turned again to captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. And they said among the heathen, the Lord had done great things for them. The Lord had done great things for us where we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. And they that sow in tears will reap in joy. And he that goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves are bringing a harvest with him. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the music today. Father, thank you for all day today, Lord, for just the way you have blessed us and met with us. Father, you've got something special for us in this word today. This word is not coming from me. It's coming from you. It's from your word. So uh, teach us some wonderful, precious truths. People did not get out here to come into the rain to hear my opinion or even hear from me. They want to hear from you. I want to hear from you. We all do. So open up our hearts and minds and receive your precious word today. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, uh, this song or this psalm uh, is, uh, it takes place after the 70-year captivity in Babylon. And you remember, God had told uh, Isaiah and the prophets, he said, tell, tell Israel, if they don't get right, they're going to be overtaken. And so, you know, the story they did, Nebuchadnezzar came and, uh, and so he took the captives into Babylon. Now, Jeremiah had said that that captivity was going to last for 70 years. Uh, whole generations of people had to pass away. And, uh, and I would imagine within the 70 years, they kind of lost hope of that or probably think maybe that's not going to be true, but it was true. After the 70 years, and Cyrus the king, uh, the Persian king, the kingdom had changed from Babylon to the, uh, the Persian kingdom. And, and so, uh, so Cyrus said, you, you can go back. And, uh, and so they, they went back. And so they said, it's like a dream. Uh, we can go back to our homeland. We've been in captivity for 70 years. We can go back to our homeland. And so they were singing this song uh, as they went back up to uh, Jerusalem. Now in verses one through three, they're praising God for their release from captivity. They're praising God for that. And in verse four, they're praying to God for their restoration because here's what they found out. Their return is kind of bittersweet. Uh, they're so, they're, they're, they're happy that they're coming back, but when they get back, they see Jerusalem in ruins. They, they see the crops, those fields have not been plowed and planted for 70 years. And, uh, and so it's, it's kind of bittersweet. And so they, they weep a little bit. They're happy, but, you know, they're weeping as well. And then in verse 5 and 6, they're persuaded of God's restitution. They say, you know, God, you didn't fail us. Your promises are true. You're not going to fail us now. And so this is what they're all about. Now, I want you to pay attention to four words uh, quickly this morning. Number one is the two, first two words are precious seed. And number two, doubtless rejoicing. Doubtless rejoicing. Now let's take a look at precious seed. Now other translations may say he that continually goes forth bearing seed. But I like what the King James Version says here because the King James Version calls it precious seed. Uh, the word seed uh, in the Bible is used 279 times, but only one time in the Bible is it referred to as precious seed. Now, there's a reason for that. So there's seed, then there's precious seed. Uh, now, the word precious uh, really doesn't flow off my mouth that easily. I'm going to count to three. Everybody say precious. One, two, three. See, women said that loud. Men went precious. Because it doesn't, it doesn't flow from us too well. Now, it flows from my wife very well. I mean, our grandkids are precious to her. Everything, you know, especially grand. So, but it doesn't flow off. Now, I don't know why. Maybe, maybe it's because of Dana Carvey when he played the church later on Saturday Night Live. And, uh, and he said, isn't that precious, right? Or maybe it could be Gollum uh, in the uh, uh, Lord of the Rings where he always referred to the ring as my precious. That freaks me out. 
And I just don't think precious is what you, you men and women that went through boot camp, and we have a lot of people in this church went through boot camp. I have a feeling that your drill sergeant did not use the word precious very much. What kind of soldier are you? I'm precious, sir. Oh, yes, you are. I don't think that happened. I, just, I, don't, I don't see that. But it's kind of unfortunate because precious is a great word. Precious is a wonderful word. As a matter of fact, the di- dictionary defines precious really in three ways. First of all, it says it's anything of high cost or worth. Number, it, it says also anything of great value. Then it gives a, a definition of highly esteemed and cherished. Uh, the Bible mentions several things. The Bible talks about the good. It talks about the better. It talks about the best. It talks about the acceptable. And it talks about the excellent. But it seems to be a whole nother category that's above the good and the excellent and the acceptable and all that. And that's this category that the Bible uses this word a very few times. But anytime it's there, we need to pay close attention to it. And that is the word precious. Uh, Now, here's the question. Listen to me say amen. What makes something precious? Because here's the thing. What's precious to me may not be precious to you. So what is it that makes it precious? I mean, some people say, well, money is precious. Well, to some people, money really isn't. Uh, so, so what makes it precious? Well, will not you listen to me? The, the only way I can define it is what makes it precious is determined by how hard it is for you to let go of it. That was good. That was a whole lot better than y'all. I'm preaching a whole lot better than y'all think I am, all right? It's determined by how hard it is for you to let go of it. If there's something in your life, in family heirloom or or whatever it may be, and you find it almost impossible, if somebody said, well, give it to me, and you find it almost impossible or even impossible to do, that thing, whatever it is, is precious to you. Now, God calls this precious seed. Now, now here, here's the word picture. Here, here they are. They've been in captivity for 70 years. They're coming back to Jerusalem, coming back to Israel, uh, you know, up to the Temple Mount. And they see the land is desolate, hadn't been plowed, hadn't been planted in 70 years, is desolate. And what they brought out with them from captivity is a bag of seed. So you better believe that seed is precious to them because this seed represents their future. This is an agricultural society. Seed is everything to them. Seed is their livelihood. Seed is their future. And so they had this seed, and the ground is barren. And and, and so here they are, the seed, and God said, I want you to take this seed, this precious seed. And the reason why it's so precious is going to be hard for you to cast it out. It's going to be hard for you to let go of it. God said, I want you to take this precious seed, and it's got to be sown. You've got to release it. You got to let go of it. And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's what precious is. L- look, hold your place there. Look at Exodus chapter 4 very quickly. Exodus chapter 4. The background of Exodus chapter 4, as you know, Moses uh, is at the burning bush. Moses has uh, left Egypt and uh, he is, uh, for 40 years, he's been tending sheep of his father in law, Jethro, and he's been on the backside of Midian. And, and so now he, he, he discovers God and encounters God at this bush that appears to be burning, but it's not burning. And, uh, and so God calls Moses and Moses, I got a calling for you. I'm going to use you to lead about 3 million Hebrews or more out of Egypt. Moses gives every excuse in the world. I can't talk. I stutter. I can't do it. Get somebody else. And so it's kind of in that dialogue, Exodus chapter four, look at verse one. Then Moses answered and he said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. I mean, look at God's answer, verse 2. And the Lord said to him, well, what's that in your hand? Moses said, it's a rod. He said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground. In other words, he released it. He let go of it. He cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Everybody say, so would I. Amen? So would I. Moses ain't crazy, man. So would I. Look what happened, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Now, there's several miracles here. First of all, uh, Moses fled from the serpent. I don't blame him. I would have done the same thing. Moses ain't that crazy. God said, come back. He came back. 
And he said, I want you to reach out your hand. He reached out his hand, and then he said, I want you to take it by the tail. Now, I don't know much about snakes. I don't care anything about snakes. To me, the only good snake is a dead snake. But the bottom line is, I know this. If you're going to take a snake and reach out and touch a snake, you don't do it by the tail. Can I get an amen? All right. Even Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter years ago, he never took a snake by the tail. Them rascals are fast. All right. And so he said, take it by the tail. So Moses takes the snake by the tail and it, and it turns back into a rod. Now, what I, what I want you to see is that you listen to me. This is good. This might be a lot better than you think. You got to let, you got to let this sermon kind of sink in a little bit. The bottom line is this, that when Moses released the precious, and by the way, was that rod precious to Moses? Yeah, you better believe it was. The, the, the Bible uh, wording here, it was a rod. Now, it could have been a shepherd's staff, but it was a rod. And I'm just thinking, maybe, because some, this rod can also be interpreted, as, uh, interpreted as, as, a, as a rod of ruling. And maybe, just maybe, this is the last thing Moses had to remind him of his life in Egypt when he left. Maybe this is a rod that, that was given to him by Pharaoh. I don't know. But this could be a shepherd's rod. But whatever it was, it reminds him of his past life. It's something he held on to tightly. This rod was precious to him. It was the first thing he picked up in the morning. Last thing he laid down at night, it was precious to him. It was his protection. He could lean on it. He had comfort in that rod. And God said, listen, I know it's precious to you. Throw it down. And when Moses released the precious, God introduced him to the miraculous. Oh, it was a whole lot better than y'all thought it was. I'm just telling you. When Moses released the precious, it wasn't until then that God could reveal to him the miraculous. And it just could be, God said, there's some things that are precious in your life. And the reason why I know it's precious is because you don't want to let go of it. It's hard to let go of it. You may even have to weep to let go of it. But it's only until you let go of the precious will I reveal to you the miraculous. And that's exactly what happened with Moses. Now that brings us to the other two words. The other two words are doubtless rejoicing. Doubtless. I, I like the word doubtless because uh, the opposite of that is doubtful. And, and, and that's where we live today. I don't know about y'all. Can somebody say a big amen? Aren't you tired of living in a doubtful world today? And all God's people said, I mean, everything's doubtful. You get up in the morning and you turn on the TV and it's doubtful. What, what is going on is doubtful. Everything's doubtful in Washington. Everything's doubtful in finances. Everything's doubtful in the world situation, wars and rumors of war. And everything is doubtful. But God said, here's some things that are doubtless. This is some things that are no doubt about it. And it's no doubt that God is on the throne. No doubt that God, uh, that, that Jesus is in control. And I like that. I'm tired of a doubt world every once in a while I'd like to have something sure in my life and when I release that that's precious to me I can be sure God is going to bless that and all God's people said it's an amazing thing doubtful you're going to get a blessing doubtful no doubt about it you're going to receive a, a harvest that's what sheaves mean it's, a, it's just a harvest you're going to re, you, it's going to come back to you you're going to receive a blessing. Uh, you know, uh, let me give you a couple examples. Now, because of time, I want, you to read the, I want you to read these stories. I'm not going to give you the whole story, and I'm not going to give you the whole scripture, but I want you to read these when you go. So write this down, 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Now, let me, let me tell you the story about it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In 1 Kings chapter 3, we find that this is before the temple was built. This, 1 Kings chapter 3 has to do with Solomon. And, uh, and, and how he desires to honor God. But uh, the, the, the God has not given him permission yet to build the temple. He knows the temple's coming, but this is before the temple. So what they did, they had certain places that they had to worship. They had certain places they could make sacrifice to the Lord. Now, one of those main places was a place called Gibeon. And it was there that Solomon sacrificed to the Lord. You know what he did in 1 Kings chapter 3? He sacrificed a thousand lambs before God. A thousand burnt offerings before the Lord. And he said, well, Solomon probably had, you know, he probably had 50,000. No, 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 no. This is before the blessing. This is before he had all of that wealth. So bottom line, if, if it had 10,000 lambs and he, and he sacrificed a thousand, that's just a tithe. 
That probably wouldn't have gotten a mention in Scripture. So he didn't have 10,000 lambs. He sacrificed 1,000 lambs. And keep in mind that when you sacrifice one lamb, that was a precious lamb because it was the best lamb in the flock. It was a spotless lamb. So Solomon takes his best producing lambs and sheep, the best ones that can provide him security for the future. He takes those thousand lambs and he sacrifices them to the Lord in Gibeon. And God said, when you release that as precious, you're doubtless going to receive a blessing. So did that happen to Solomon? You better believe. That night, that very night after Solomon did that, God comes to him and said, Solomon, what do you want from me? Solomon, let me do something for you. Solomon, I want to bless you. You name it. You name it. Boy, I've gone to God many times and said, God, will you bless me? God, please bless me. But uh, I'm telling you, there's not many times God comes to me and says, uh, you name it. Whatever it is, you name it. And of course, you know, Solomon said, well, Lord, I just, I want wisdom. And I want to rule your people well. Well, God was flat blessed by that. So not only did he give Solomon wisdom, but he gave him all of these cattle and all these sheep and all these houses and all these lands and all of that. God blessed him richly. Why? Because he was willing to release that which was precious to him. Let me give you another Bible example. You remember Jesus is in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Remember that? And so uh, Mary takes this uh, spike nard. It's, it's, a, it's a costly perfume. As a matter of fact, the Bible lets us in on how expensive it was because it, w- it said it was w- worth a year's wages to her. Now, can you imagine that, 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 that people back then didn't get hardly paid anything, but can you imagine a year's wage of this priceless perfume is, is the most valuable thing she owned. This alabaster box of this sweet, precious Perfume, most expensive thing she had in the house, probably the most expensive thing that, that, that her and Martha and Lazarus had in their house. She takes that and she pours it on the head of Jesus and anoints Jesus with this perfume. Now, you know, Judas was in that crowd. Judas looked at that and said, how dare you? That money, that thing could have been sold and we could have helped the poor. Now, Jesus, Judas really wasn't concerned about that. Jesus knew that. But Judas is saying, Judas is looking at that and he said, that's wasteful. And God said, no, 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 that's not wasteful. That's worshipful. Because anytime you come to me and you lay out what's precious to you in worship, I will bless that. Ladies and gentlemen, there is worship and there is precious worship. And there's a big difference. We come in here about 95% of the time. Most of us come in here and we worship God. Love the songs, love the singing, love the worship, love all of it. But that's worship and that's good and that's fine. But there comes time there ought to be some precious worship in our heart. And what is that? That's when I come to God and I say, God, listen, everything I have, everything I own if it weren't for you I'd be in, I would be in a sinner's hell if it wasn't for you I'd split hell wide open Lord everything I have my, my home my finances my family my church my car everything I have Lord it belongs to you and Lord I'm releasing that back to you Lord you take it you take my life you take everything it all belongs to you I'm trusting you with everything in my life I'm not just trusting you as Savior I'm trusting you as Lord of my life. And when you do that, that is precious worship. And all God's people say it. And I want you to notice what happened. When she pours that perfume on Jesus' head, the Bible says that the fragrance of that filled the room. In other words, what she gave to Jesus, what she released on Jesus in worship It all came back on her as well. And not only did it come back on her, but it came back on those around her. That's precious worship. And that's not a waste. And it never is a waste. Jesus said, if you really want to worship me, if you really want to know me, then you got to come to me and say, Lord, it's all yours. You see, I think sometimes we kind of do a disservice and we say, well, you know, all God wants is a tithe. Just just give God 10%. And many of you have a tough time with that. Most of you don't even practice that. And God says, no, no, you missed the point. I want it all. I want all of it. It all belongs to me. You just got to trust me with it. 
You got to trust me. Now, God only requires that little bit. That's just a starting point. But the bottom line is, it all comes back to what's precious to us. Because God knows money's precious to us. There are things that are precious to us. And God said, listen, I want it. I want it all. And he said, you give what's precious to Jesus, you will doubtless. Everybody say doubtless. Doubtless. You will doubtless. Come again with rejoicing. There's going to be rejoicing in your future. There's going to be rejoicing in your life. Now, here's the here's question. Why would God ask that from me? Why would God want that from me? I mean, I'm not saved by works, right? I'm saved by faith. I'm saved by grace. Why would God want that from me? Well, that's a good question. I'm going to show you why God wants that from us. I'm going to, tell you, I'm going to show you why God asks that of us. And I want to tell you why God deserves that from us. Now, once again, I want you to write this scripture down. I don't have time to read it all. I'm going to tell you the story. Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. In Numbers chapter 16, there's an uprising among the, uh, uh, among the Hebrews. There's, a, there's an uprising as they're out in the desert, and they're wandering in the desert for 40 years. And a man by the name of Korah, who used to be a choir leader, used to be a chorus leader, and all of a sudden he stirs up the people and says, well, who gives Moses the right to lead? Who gives Aaron the right to be the high priest? Who told them they could do that? And starts stirring up to them, yeah, who told him they could do that? Who told them they could exert authority among us? That's why I think children of Israel were just, you know, pre-Baptists. Can I get amen, you know? And who, to, who told them they could do that? And so, you know what, God, and by the way, you, you check it out, you, 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 you look at it, you will find that the one sin in the Old Testament that God judged harshly over any other sin. You say, well, I know what it was, the worshiping idols. No, it wasn't. It was griping and complaining. Griping and complaining among the people. God punished that. He punished it so much that he took Korah and he stood him and his family and all of his followers up in front of the children of Israel and the earth opened up and swallowed them whole. I mean, right before their eyes. And now you would have thought, and then the earth closed up. Now you would have thought that would shut their mouth, right? No, it got worse. That's why I know they were Baptists. Amen? I mean, they got worse. And so they kept griping and they kept complaining. And so, well, you know what God does? God said, okay, I'm going to put an end to this. You guys want to know why, especially why Aaron is the uh, high priest? I'm going to put a stop to all of this. He said, this is what we're going to do. Every one of you, you go and you cut down a stick. You cut down, you cut down a staff. You cut down a dead stick. And I want you to write or carve the name of the leader of your tribe. And there were 12 tribes. I want you to do that. And then I want you to lay that dead stick on the altar of the, of the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to lay it on there. And then God said this. He said, I want you to walk away. Then I want you to come back a little time later and the stick, the dead stick that has come back to life, that's my chosen one. I'm putting a stop to all this griping and complaining. I will show you by this miracle who the chosen one is. And they did that. They all went, they all cut a stick. It was all dead. They laid it on the Ark of the Covenant. They went away. They came back. There was only one stick that was alive. There was one stick that sprouted leaves. And not only had it budded and sprouted leaves, that stick, and it was the rod of Aaron, it was Aaron's stick, was already producing almonds right in front of their eye. When God does something, he does it well. And all God's people said, amen. And God said, this live stick, now follow me. Come on, you listen to me, say amen. Follow me here. This live stick, that's my chosen. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world where people say Muhammad is the chosen one. Joseph Smith is the chosen one. Confucius is the chosen one. Buddha is the chosen one. God said, enough of this. Bring them to me. Let me cut them down. And God cut them down. And then God says, the one that's alive, the one that comes back from the dead, he is my chosen one. Buddha is in the grave. Confucius is in the grave. Joseph Smith is in the grave. And a couple of days from now, I'm going to go to the empty tomb and find that Jesus ain't there. He's never been there. He rose from the dead. He is alive. And you better believe the Lord Jesus Christ is God's holy anointed one. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise for that. Amen. That's right. You know what Peter said? In 1 Peter, Peter said, you know what? We're not redeemed by all of this religious trappings. We're not redeemed by the good works. We're not redeemed by religious traditions. We are, de- and, and check it out. Listen to what he said. We are redeemed by the precious, everybody say precious, the precious blood of Jesus. And you better believe that blood was precious. 
When you read in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You know what that means? That means he was only son. You see, you and I can be children of God, but we're not the begotten children of God. Jesus was God's only, one and only son. And he's the one that had precious blood flowing through his veins. And God said, he's precious to me. He's my son. And I'm going to release the blood of my son, the precious blood for you and for me. And you better believe that when God released the blood of his son, you know what he did? He said, they will doubtless come again with rejoicing. Is there anybody here today, anybody here in this service right now today that would say, you know what? I did that one time. I, I trusted in the precious blood of Jesus and I release, I release my doubts and my fears and, and my fear of death and, and all of my questions. I just released it on Jesus and I've never regretted a day by Jesus has saved me. He is my precious savior and I've never regretted it. And from then, I, yes, I have days that are up and down, but for the most part, I have rejoicing in my heart because I know my sin is forgiven. Heaven is my home. Can anybody here say that? Say a big amen. 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 What's precious to you? What is it? Is it your money? You see, for many of you, for some of you, uh, money is so precious. And see, here's what I want you to understand. You give God the precious, you may, it may cause you to weep. It may cause you to weep. He said, he said we, we go for weeping. Bearing precious seed would doubtless come again with rejoicing. For some of you, money is so precious. So much so that you, you just won't release it. You won't give it back to God. You, you, would rather, you would rather for missionaries to go unsupported and for mi ministry to go without. You'd rather for uh, the church to struggle financially. You, you would rather for all that to happen before you would let go of your precious money. And give it to God. But let me ask you this. If you went broke tomorrow, you know what the first thing you'd probably do? You'd cry out to God. And what God is saying, listen, before that ever happened, why don't you cry out to me? Why don't you trust me with it before that ever happens? Because if you'll release that to me, I promise you, there'll be rejoicing in your life, in your financial life. Does anybody here believe that today? All right. For some of you, your kids are precious to all of us our kids are precious but for some of you your kids are so precious you're afraid to let jesus have them you're afraid to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the lord you're afraid of that for some of you it may be your grandkids they're precious to you see in my age in my my, my grandkids are precious. Now, my kids were precious to me. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, but my grandkids, you see, it, it, the reason why my grandkids are so very precious to me is because I knew I screwed up my kid's life, but my, my grandkids, I'm not responsible for that. Let the parents screw up their life. Amen? I mean, you know what I'm saying? But I still have to turn them over to Jesus. My little five-year-old grandboy, little Asher, the other day, he said, Papa, I'm going to be five. I said, what? He said, I'm going to be five, Papa. I said, let's do this, Asher. Don't be five. When your birthday comes, let's just put four candles on your birthday cake, and let's let you be four. He said, you can't do that, Papa. You can't do that. I said, well, Asher, I want to do that. I don't want you to grow up. I don't want you to be five. He said, but I got to. I said, Asher, I want you to stay little all your life. He said, I can't do that. I have to grow up. And he's right. You have to grow up. You have to let go up. You have to let go up. So what's precious to you? You know how you know? It's how hard it is for you to let go of it.